My second story is another true ghost story. And this one was collected by a woman named Helen Creighton, who was an ethnographer that traveled around the maritime provinces in the middle of the century. And she wrote a number of books and published them, and she filled one entire book with ghost stories. It's called Luno's Ghosts. And when she was going around, you know, starting to collect the ghost stories, people started saying, oh, you got to talk to this guy. I mean, that happens a lot. But a lot of people said, you got to go to the small town of Nova Scotia and look up this guy. So in 1947, she went to visit Mr. A.B. Thorne, and he told her a story that had happened when he was 20, in the very early part of the 20th century. Now, Mr. Thorne had grown up in the town that he still lived in, but even then there was not always a lot of work for a young man in Nova Scotia, so he was back and forth from the States. But every time he was home, he was with his best friend, Joe Holmes. Thorne and Joe, they just went everywhere together, and one night, when he was home, they were hanging out, and at 10 o'clock at night, one of them decided to mail a letter. And you think, post office? 10 o'clock at night? Well, the post office was in somebody's house, so you could go and mail it whenever you could get the family up. So they mailed their letter, and it was such a beautiful, clear, full moon night, that they just sat across the street from the house and talked for a while. Now, Mr. Thorne wanted to make it very clear they had not been drinking. They were young men in the 20s in Nova Scotia, but they had not been drinking. <laughs> and it was such a clear night, you could see almost as bright as day. And they were sitting there, and they were talking for a while. And they heard a sound from behind the house. It sounded like a hoe striking a rock in the turnip field there. But no one was gardening at 10 o'clock at night. The grass around the house at the end of the summer was about three feet high, it was very tall. And they saw the thing crawling towards them in the grass. Shadow stutters in the night, a pale face quivers. Move your step a little faster to the light. But they kept talking, and it disappeared again. Again, and it came halfway across the road, and then it went back. And by then, Thorne decided to say, Joe, did you see that? And Joe said, yeah. And then the thing came out a third time, and it stood by the cherry tree across the street and shook it. And the apple trees on their side of the street started to shake too, so hard that apples started dropping from their branches. And finally Thorne said, I think I need to go home. The problem is, someone lived in one direction, and Joe lived in the other. So they decided to go to Joe's house. And they started walking, and then they were running. And Joe was not a strong man, but he could run as fast as the best of them. And it was hard for Thorne to keep up. But they ran, and they ran, and the thing started to chase them. And it ran after them, and it cut across the field, and they ducked this way, and they made it to Joe's mother's house. And they could see the thing still coming toward them across the field. It was the shape of a man. But they really didn't know what it was. And they started to feel kind of stupid that they had run all across town from this thing and they didn't even know what it was. But someone said, Joe, I need to see what this is. I need to go back. I won't be scared if you're with me. Shadow moves just as fast as my poor heart beats. More I try to lose, the more it follows me. Well, you can't run and you can't hide. Lock the door and pray at night. Well, you can't run and you can't hide. Cause he's gonna get you on the other side. So they started to walk back. And the thing came toward them. And when they were about 20 feet apart, they stopped. And said again, I really want to get close to this thing. I need to look it in the eye. And I won't be scared if you're with me. And so together they walked up to the thing. And it was tall. And it had on a white collared shirt with a hard chest, black suspenders, and black pants. Its skin was waxy and pale, and its eyes were sunk deep in its head, but very bright. I looked for all the 
world like a skeleton. And in that moment, Joe screamed and started to run, and Thorn ran after him, and they ran into Joe's house and slammed the door. And then they looked out the window, for the thing had run after them, but it stopped at the stone wall at the edge of the yard. And there was an old wooden beam stretched along the top of that stone wall, and the thing hopped up, and it balanced on top of that beam, and it stared into the front window. <laughs> Shadow step through the window. The hole hung out through. The light of day erases, but I, I can't forget the way it looked me around. As soon as they touched it, it couldn't have held a bird. But it had held the thing. Now, Thorne, he told the story, but Joe was really uncomfortable. He only talked about it to Thorne and to his mother. But a year later, Joe got very sick. He had tuberculosis of the throat. And he was in terrible pain. But he never wandered in his mind. He was sharp until the end. And towards the end, he started talking more about that night. The Irish sometimes talk about something called a forerunner, where you get a vision or a sound of an impending death. Now, that forerunner doesn't usually chase you across town, but Joe started to wonder if this was his forerunner. And a few days before he died, he told his mother that he wasn't in pain anymore. But the thing had come in the night and rubbed his throat and taken the pain away. A few days later, he died. And Thorne, he sat up with his best friend the whole time. But even he got a shock at the funeral. For when he looked in that casket, there was Joe laid out in a white shirt with a hard chest and a collar, black suspenders and black pants with his face Pale, his skin waxy, and his eyes sunk deep in his head. Bring mm -hmm. 